Father God, we thank you for a wonderful day. We thank you for waking us up, Lord. We thank you for bringing us together to sing praises to your name, God. So many things could have happened, but because you love us with your everlasting love, God, you brought us back together in your house of worship one more time, and we're thankful this morning. Bless our praises. Bless our worship, Lord, as we give it to you from our heart. We ask you, God, that you will come down in a mighty way and fill this place with your anointing, fill it with your presence, we pray now. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen. This song says, I know who I am. It's got a wonderful, sweet beat to it. So I want you to, you know, clap your hands as best as you can. We won't pay you any mind if you even clap off beat. So we'll be all right. Here we go. One. We are chosen. We are a chosen generation. Call for to show his excellence. All I require. All I require for life God has given me. And I know who I am. Sing it again. We are a chosen. We are a chosen generation. Call for to show his excellence. All I require. All I require for life, God has given me, and I know who I am. I know who God says I am, what He says I am, where He says I'm at. I know who I am. I know who God says I am, what He says I am, where He says I'm at. I know who I am. I'm walking in power. Look 
of me, I am a wonder. It doesn't matter what you see now. Can you see his glory? Cause I know who I am. together one more time God. 
So I wondered to myself why it is that we tell stories. We tell stories to experience and to teach lessons, right? Best way to teach a lesson is to tell a story. We also tell stories to create community. Together, we tell stories that speak of our lives together. Almost every person I have met at New Horizon has told me about Pumpkin Charlie. In fact, I asked somebody what his surname was, and nobody knew. <laughs> well, he doesn't have a surname. He's Pumpkin Charlie. <laughs> Don't you know? People have shared wonderful stories, and, and there really is a sense of our stories speak about our lives together. Um, I went to Atlanta last weekend to celebrate my birthday with my family, with my sisters, and, and a cousin. And the last time, really, that I had a birthday with both my sisters was almost 30 years ago, after they immigrated. So it was like, I felt like, you know that little girl again, where it's like, you know when you're blowing out the candles and you, the people that are around you are your cousins and your sisters, and that's how you celebrate a birthday as a child. I mean, it was loads of fun. So we tell stories because we wanna share our lives together. We tell stories because sometimes we want to gain someone's attention. We lighten the load, like some of us are carrying heavy loads, and sometimes we want to share a story that just says, like, I've been down that road. I mean, we sang that in that hymn, let grief and pain do its work. Sometimes even the songs we, we sing tell a story. Stories have power in them, and our own stories are the most powerful because they really speak to our lives lived out. Jesus told lots of stories. And, and he told stories because they went beyond the words themselves. They helped people. And especially when things were hard, he even told stories more and more. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at the stories that Jesus told. Because in them are lessons. And sometimes they're really hard lessons. You know, when things get really difficult, the one thing you notice about Jesus is he starts to tell stories. Because a story sometimes reveals a secret and maybe even a sin. Perhaps at other times it really pierces our souls. It catches us in the moments of our prejudice or blindness. Because somehow in the story we don't feel so antagonized, but when, then we allow the story to open ourselves up. And the stories that Jesus tells really are there to transform us and change us. So today I'm, we, we listen to the scripture that is about discipleship. Here is Jesus, and, 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 the, and Luke wants us to know that the crowds were large. I mean, the crowds had gathered, and there were large crowds that had gathered to come and listen to Jesus, large crowds. And as they gathered, you know, you would almost begin to think when a large crowd gathers, the temptation is to, well, let's hang on to that movement. You know, but I mean, Jesus does absolutely the opposite. It's like, you have to ask yourself, is he trying to get rid of the crowd? I mean, he really begins to go into the essence of what is really challenging. He says, well, if you want to be a disciple and listen to the word, it's about discipleship. He says, if you want to be a disciple, it's really simple. You need to, if you don't hate your father, mother, spouse, brother, sister, children, if you don't pick up the cross and if you don't sell all your possessions, well, then you can't be a disciple. And so this morning, I want to speak about two things. Number one, we are called to count the cost. Don't you, like, you know, don't, don't you, before you buy something, like you want to know what's the bottom line? Don't you do that? And don't you sometimes Google search, like the best deal? I needed to buy a TV, and I Google search that. <laughs> so you kind of, we all look for the best deal. Don't we want to know What's it going to cost me? I mean, have we not asked this about our faith? What is it going to cost me? This particular passage is not about salvation. Let, let us be clear. 
We are saved by grace through faith. None of us has enough collateral to buy salvation. We can't buy salvation by our works. We can't buy salvation by our good deeds. Salvation is a free gift, and that's what we celebrate. And we remind ourselves that today at communion. We receive, and, and I love the fact that in the Methodist church that children receive communion. And I have heard in every single context, in every single world, but what do they understand about communion? They don't, but neither do we. Because really, it's the mystery of God's grace that says, come, come and eat and share of this one meal and know that you are so profoundly loved. Doesn't matter what you've done, who you are, where you've been, you are profoundly loved. And I've sacrificed my life for you. This is not about salvation. It is about discipleship and transformation. So, so the world is kind of asking like this deep question you know, who are the Christians out there? How have Christians made a difference to the world that we live in? And we often get caught in a kind of a binary mindset of an us and them. But really what Jesus calls us to do is to, to really focus in on our own lives. And so he says, count the cost of discipleship. So what does discipleship cost us? It costs us transformation. And how do we transform according to Jesus? Well, the first thing he says to us is that you need to look at all your relationships of formation. Now, I, wa I want to just kind of settle you now because I remember when I was 18 years old reading this particular passage and thinking to myself, but I love my mother and father. You know, I'd, like I, I love my children. You know, I, I love my family. I don't want to, do, you know, what does it mean? How is, is Jesus really, he's teaching and, and he has this crowd following him and then he says the thing that literally destroys the people of Israel. He, he in that moment seems to be, if you read the passage literally, destroying the nucleus family. But he's really not doing that. If you look at the word and the Greek word, in menu, you begin to see it's a matter of perception. And what he is saying is deal with the places of your formation. We are all formed well or badly in the places we are born. And ultimately there comes a point in every single adult's life where you choose to either keep making the same generational mistakes or to shift from them. And what Jesus is saying is that the transformation of discipleship actually calls you to the most intimate place of the very things that formed you. And go and deal with them in that place. Own it for yourself. Really, this passage is about, now, now remember, he's talking to a Jewish context, and it was from one generation to the next generation, it was passed on. You followed the tradition of your family. That's, that's how your formation of faith was made. But what Jesus is saying in this particular text is, you remain responsible for your own road of discipleship and transformation. The Florida United Methodist Church really speaks about we exist to create transforming disciples. And transforming disciples is an uncomfortable place because it means that we've never arrived at the destination. That God is always doing a work in us. And so we have to confront the places of our formation. What in my former beliefs do I have to address? And, and there is no age limit to what we confront. We are constantly being transformed. The thing that we discover about being a Christian is that ultimately salvation is a gift from God, but transformation is a lifetime event. The only place our transformation is complete is ultimately when we cross over from this life to the next. If God is not constantly transforming us, then we need to reevaluate the places of our faith journey. As if that was not hard enough, Jesus then says, I want you to pick up your cross. Do you notice that he hasn't been crucified yet? There is no crucifixion yet in the Gospel of Luke. The crucifixion is to come. And I wondered to myself when Jesus was walking on that road in Jerusalem, whether there were still disciples that were around him.
that remembered when he carried his cross to Calvary, that one has to carry the cross. Sometimes the thing that we struggle with the most as Christians is that bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to good people. Sometimes one, one has to, is overwhelmed by the pain people carry. And, and, and it's not to make light of bad things or to excuse bad things, but ultimately it's to say that, that the journey of Jesus is really one where the transforming presence of God's unending love is even there when we carry the heaviest cross. Have you not ever met a moment in your own life where it has felt like your world was going to end? And that's the place where we discover the presence of Christ. Pick up your cross. And really, it also says to us that even the hardest things we face in life become the places of transformation for us. We are constantly being transformed. And we're being transformed into the likeness of Christ, which is the likeness of an unending love. So it's costly to be a disciple. The third thing Jesus says is, I want you to sell all your possessions. Like, I want to tell you, I reckon that crowd, I wonder how many people were left at the end of that teaching. It's like, seriously, this guy's like, something is wrong with him. It's like, he's definitely got it wrong. He's talking about the destruction of family, but I want to remind you that the very next chapter he deals with the prodigal son, which is a deep affirmation of family. He's not talking about the, the destruction of family. He's ultimately talking about how we are transformed and we cannot allow the things of the past to limit our transformation. He's also speaking about the fact that there will be crosses to bear and they will be crushing, but we will be given the strength of God to get through what we are in. And the third thing he says is deal with your possessions. Th that's pretty rough. Um, so we hear a story about a young man that was really wealthy, and he comes to Jesus in the middle of the night just before Jesus dies, and he says, how do I get into heaven? Like, how do I actually get to be a disciple? Well, Jesus hasn't changed his story. He says to him, it's very simple, sell everything you have and follow me, okay? We're going to take up the offering again. <laughs> Just want you to be ready. Okay, Dave. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, what are, oh my Lord, what are the, you know, you brought us this woman from Africa and now she's, uh, <laughs> like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Okay, so sell your possessions. It's really, what are the things where we place our value? I'm afraid that it seems to be that, that we cannot become lukewarm Christians. Because it's like, you know, we know the Laodicean church, like become lukewarm Christians, like we neither here nor there, you know, but ultimately there is a, there is a passionate fire when we become transformed disciples of Jesus Christ. It means the work is never done, doesn't matter how old we are or young we are, the work is never done, and God keeps transforming us. Daniel was a little boy, and he's like a big, young, wonderful man now, and um, I decided to buy him Lego. He got a gift um, as Lego as a little boy, but we had never done Lego before. We had never played with Lego. I'd never played with Lego, so I've seen a couple of people in, in your place, Nick. You love Lego, so I, I, I took out all these pieces, and it's a little bit like when you go to What's that big shop where you have to go and buy furniture? Ikea. And like when you end up with half the number of screws in your hand afterwards. <laughs> Has anybody ever done that from Ikea? That is why we don't go to Ikea. So. <laughs> but ultimately, like you get these pieces and you get an instruction manual. Thank you, Lord, for an instruction. And if you can follow the instruction manual, you'll make the bionicle at the end of the day. And I remember Dan and I spent hours and hours playing Lego when he grew up. It's a little bit like being shaped into what God wants us to become. The instruction manual is the scripture. The instruction manual are our experiences. It is our tradition and it's our ability to reason. But ultimately, God is always transforming us. Sometimes, the loveliest part about Lego is you can break that up and you can remake it. 
So that really is the choice we are making. I am no longer in control, God. I hand it over to you. And that is not easy. But that is the cost of discipleship. So if you want to know the bottom line, this passage gives you the bottom line. It is a sold out life for God, Jesus first. You know, the second thing that I really want to speak about is it's, it's really a decision where we say yes to transformation, to an uncomfortable journey, a deconstruction of things, but ultimately to a place where, where we know that the work of God is being done in our lives. So Jesus says, I know this is difficult for you, so I'm going to give you just two touch points. I'm going to tell you about a king. You know, before he goes to war, he looks at what he has and he, and he assesses his enemy's position and he weighs in on whether or not he has what it takes to defeat the enemy. And if he doesn't, he strategizes and he gets ahead of the game with, with his peace talks and he negotiates a different type of settlement. Be careful when you tackle life without looking at what's in your hand. The second thing he talks about is building a tower. And, and when we, you know, like building a tower. I don't know, Paul, but towers must require significant foundation, right? It's like deep foundation. They do? Okay, that's a good thing. So, so it's like kind of, this is foundational work. There's deep foundations that we need to set. And the truth is, we never see the foundations. But we know when the, when the building collapses, we know when the storms of life come, that we, that we will be shaken. People tell me that in hurricanes, that everything bends down. You know, it's like, it's like, and I suppose the truth is, it's those places that literally rip into our lives that kind of call us to what's foundational. So if we want to be transformed disciples, we, may, we pay attention to the foundation. And you know the truth is nobody sees the foundation. No one sees it. No one sees what you do behind closed doors. No one sees how you pray, how you think. No one sees the secrets, but you do and God does. And so the, the call today is to say, God, I'm going to say yes to a transformed discipleship. I'm going to say yes to my thinking that needs to be changed. I'm going to say yes to the way in which I deal with the people that are challenging in my life. Who right now in your life is challenging you to the point where the words you want to use cannot be used in public? You know, what, what are you facing right now that is really crushing soul? And, and the message we keep getting from the scripture is go to the foundation of things. Go to God. Go to God. Deal with evil. Deal with sin. Deal with pride. Deal with pain in the foundations. Deal with God. And ultimately, we will be shaped. Really, I think what Jesus was saying when he turned around to his disciples is saying, this is not just a religion. When he spoke to the Jewish leaders, he said, this is a lifestyle. You don't get to hang on to your offenses. You don't get to, to live a life where you can be cruel to other people. You, you really get to, you, you don't get to come into places of salvation based on what others have done. But he speaks about we choose with our mind, with our heart, with our souls, with our eyes, with our hands, with our actions, to be a disciple. And so disciples are real people, living out a real faith in a real world that is tested because we know in God we are loved. I suppose in some ways when Jesus preached this on his way to Jerusalem, he was sifting the crowd. And there are times where we need to be shaken. John Wesley used to say, unless you are offended or convicted, you've never heard the gospel. And so I suppose this is a moment where all of us are called to the economy of God's transformation in our lives. So let us come before God in prayer.
Lord God, we acknowledge today that the journey of faith isn't simple, nor is it easy. But really, it is about our daily choices. So God, we want to thank you that you pour down on us an unconditional love. But sometimes the hardest thing is to pour out unconditional love from ourselves. Perhaps today, our biggest stumbling block is to actually receive that unconditional love from you. Maybe we have been the barrier to receiving your unconditional love. And so in the mystery of communion now, we pray that somehow your spirit will touch us with an unconditional, never-ending love. God, we want to be disciples that are shaped, as Jeremiah speaks, at the potter's wheel. And where there are things in our lives that need to be reshaped, we give you permission today to do that. Transform us into the likeness of Christ so that we may live life in all its fullness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, we're going to prepare for communion now, but before we do that, we'll probably find the children are going to come in at some point. Um, I'm going to invite those that are coming into membership, if you'll join us in the front, please, in this moment, so that we can celebrate you. So we have member, new members today. We have Debbie, Diane, and Marisol. So I know this is hard, so I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm sorry to do this to you. So you're going to turn and face the congregation. Is that okay? So I know it's difficult, so I thought I'm going to make it easy. I'm going to stand over here, right over here, because then it's easy, because I'm part of the congregation right now. And so, friends, it's always an exciting time to, to be amongst people that come into membership, because the body of Christ is made up of all of us that are here with different gifts. And so today we want to celebrate that. I know some of you have been around for a long time and some of you, and I know that Marisol, you have been here and now you're back. Um, after a number of years, God has led you back here. But it is a place to celebrate your presence and your gifts and to confirm again what we believe is the kingdom of God. And so I ask you, do you as Christ's body, and this is us, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these people that are now before you in your care? Yes. Will you surround them with the community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their service to others? We will pray for them that, that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Let the children come in. Hey guys, come on in. Come on in. Now it is our joy to welcome our new, should we say sisters? <laughs> Let's just say sisters. Now it is our joy to welcome our new sisters in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as members of the family of Christ. Members of the household of God, I commend these people to you. Diane, Debbie, and Marisol. I commend them to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith and confirm their hope and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given 
and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. <laughs>